Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church of Gaston. I hope you're having a great day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are so glad that you're with us today. Here are some activities that you'll want to be a part of. Children's safety training will be this afternoon at 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. If you are interested in working with any of our children's programs, this training is required. For more information, please see Tracy Risch. It's almost time for Trunk or Treat. We will need lots of candy and volunteers. Trunk or Treat will be Saturday, October 29th from 2 to 4 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center if you wish to do a trunk, or you may simply call the church office. For more information, contact Travis Henderson. Choir practice will be next Sunday, October 16th at 5 p.m. in the choir room. For more information, contact Sherelle Oct. We have a chance to touch the lives of children all over the world. Our church goal this year is 300 boxes. The November 6th deadline is quickly approaching. Each box costs $10 to ship. That money can be put in with your regular offering. Just be sure to designate it to Samaritan's Purse. Be praying about how God will have you participate. Please see Margie Risch, Cheryl Reynolds, or Colette Knight for more information. The Senior Adult Apple Trip has been moved to Thursday, October 20th. Meet at the church at 7 a.m. For more information, contact Vicki Vidry. Items for the homebound baskets are due October 26th. The baskets will be delivered on Sunday, November 6th. There's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center if you would like to deliver a basket. For more information, contact me, Hannah Henderson. Please pray about your participation in these activities. Also, don't forget to lift up our sick, homebound, bereaved, as well as our pastor, church leaders, and upcoming services here at First Baptist Church of Gaston, the caring place that gathers, grows, and goes, all for the glory of God. Well, hello, my name is Pastor Brady, and you have found, successfully found, our online streaming right here on our Facebook page. Or maybe you're watching on our website. No matter where you're watching from, we want to thank you for tuning in for today's live worship service from right here at the Caring Place that gathers, grows, and goes all for the glory of God. We hope and pray you enjoy your worship experience today. So let us know in the comment section below if you're on Facebook that you're here. Hit that share button and grab your Bible and get ready to worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, during this worship service today. Thank you, and we're glad you're here. I want to read our opening verse of scripture. I want to ask you to stand and read this with me as it will be on the screen. And then I'll ask you to remain standing as we sing our opening song. But Revelation chapter 4 verse 11. Let's read this together. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. That tells us right there that our God is worthy of worship. So why don't you stand, continue standing as we sing worthy of worship. Songs we can sing. 
As Rhonda comes this morning, we're going to sing a song called Raise a Hallelujah. And you might be in the middle of a battle right now. It might be a, a battle of finances or with your job. It may be a battle of uh, even conflicts in your family or uh, friends. But your, our weapon is Jesus Christ. To praise him, to worship him in the middle of our battles is what is going to get us through. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah.
Thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship. And before Miss Carolyn comes and leads us in a time of special music, want to lift up in prayer um, several folks and things going on. Please be in prayer for the family of Melissa Goff and Cindy Lambert. And uh, you might remember Melissa's grandmother and also Cindy's mother passed away um, about 10 days ago, actually 11 days ago. That celebration of life service will be today at 11 or at 3 p.m. at Kaufman Funeral Home in Lexington. So I'll be doing that service. I ask your prayers for that. We also want to lift up um, William Dowd, who's here today and taught Sunday school today. We want to lift him up and his family in prayers with his brother passing away this past Friday. Harvey, is that correct? Um, Harvey Dowd. So let's uh, just lift up that family in prayer. William, we love you. We love your whole family, your brothers, your sisters, everybody. Um, so we want to continue to lift them up in prayer. And also, um, after I do the celebration of life service today, I'm going to be taking a three-hour drive to Myrtle Beach, and our seniors, some of our seniors will be coming up tomorrow. We're going to have our senior adult retreat this week um, where we go with several other churches. Um, one of them is Hillcrest in the upstate and some other churches in the upstate, and we have a conference, right? We have several speakers. Be praying for them. Be praying for those that are leading us in worship. It's just going to be a great time at the beach to praise uh, the Lord and have a time of refreshing with our senior adults. So that will be, there's a group of 15 of us going. Um, so I'll be back Wednesday night. So I'm coming back early, but just be in prayer for them with that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just want to thank you and praise you for the opportunity we have to worship you. Lord, we want to lift up several requests to you this morning. We just know that you're the almighty God, sufficient, all healing, all powerful. Lord, we lift up um, William Dowd and, and Thomas and Miss Marion and just that whole family, Lord, we ask that you would comfort them um, with the passing um, of their brother. God, we know that you're going to be with them. We pray you be with the Goff and Lambert family and Sanford family as well today as we celebrate the life of their grandmother and mother. And God, we also want to lift up in prayer um, a man that ran into a church member this morning that wanted us to pray for a specific court case. God, we don't know the whole situation, but Lord, we know you have that in the palm of your hand. Lord, we ask you to bless the tithes and the offerings that are given today, that they will honor and glorify you and continue to be used in this community to change hearts and lives for you. And Lord, I just want to say thank you for what you're doing in our church. Lord, what we're seeing is not normal. Lord, what we're seeing hasn't been seen in a long time. But thank you for the 163 people that were in Sunday school today, Father. Thank you for the people that are attracted to falling more in love with Jesus every day. Be with Miss Carolyn as she leads us in worship. And Lord, hide me behind your cross in just a few minutes as your word is preached and proclaimed. In Jesus' name and all God's people say.
song that Carolyn Kelly and me used to sing all the time, and I miss her. Thank you, Miss Carolyn, for that. And uh, I really wish I could have known Miss Carolyn Kelly. But guess what? I will one day. I will one day. And if you know Jesus, you will too. So if you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to continue to be in the first book of the Bible. We're going to be in Genesis. Uh, this morning, we're going to start in chapter 8. Uh, and we have officially hit the midweek point in our series. So we're at the middle point of our sermon series called Being Righteous in a Fallen World. And throughout the first six weeks of this series, we looked at how this series takes an in-depth look at the life and the time period of Noah that was found in Genesis chapter 6 through 9 and how we can live a righteous life for God amidst a fallen, dark, and sinful world. So the first six weeks in this series, we spent looking at Genesis chapter 6 and chapter 7. And for the last few weeks of this series, we only have five more. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 8 and then Genesis chapter 9. And so last week, I preached a message entitled, um, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, from Genesis chapter 7, verses 17 through 24. And so, and when I preached that, I asked you the question, I said, the flood was universal and not limited, but how do we know this? And so it was a very apologetics-based message as we looked at, so how can we know from the Bible and prove that the flood was um, universal and not limited? And so we looked at that in three specific ways. We looked at the wording that was provided, the waters that prevailed, and the world that was purged. So we looked at those three things. If you haven't viewed that message yet or you weren't here last week, you can do that online. And you can find that on Facebook or on YouTube. So um, for this morning's message, I want to preach a message entitled, An Unforgettable Father. An Unforgettable Father. And it will be in verses 1 through 12 of the 8th chapter of Genesis. But the sermon in a sense is this. We know that we serve a heavenly father who is incapable of ever forgetting us. Because in this passage we see the worth of remembrance, the winds of renewal, and the window release that occur. So we see these three things in this passage. And as we've been walking through verse by verse, and I've already mentioned that Noah and his family, the eight members of that family, they spent 375 days in the ark. Now, the events that are getting ready to occur that we're about to read about, those started happening at the 150-day um, mark, okay? The winds and the water and everything kind of started to calm down after that mark. But we need to realize that they went at least 150 days, if not longer, of God not speaking to them. The Bible does not record any time other than what we see in Genesis chapter 8 of him speaking to them. So after the Lord shut them in, there is no conversation there. And it would have been very easy for the people in the ark to just assume, did God forget about us? It's raining profusely for 40 days and the waters are going nuts. There's thunderstorms. We've never even seen this thing called rain. And the waters are turning and they're going up and they're going down. Did God forget about me? 
Now, the Bible doesn't record anything about that, right? The Bible doesn't say that they woke up and they had the feeling that they felt like they got forgotten. But Warren Wearsby said, perhaps somebody in the family experienced an occasional fleeting fear that maybe God didn't care for them anymore. And we don't know this for a fact because Scripture doesn't say it. But I believe a lot of us have had those moments where we feel forgotten. I remember as a child, I was um, going to Sunday school. Tell you what, I'm glad my parents brought me up in Sunday school. So then when I got older, it wasn't, it wasn't a question. I was going to be in Sunday school. So if you have young children, make sure they're in Sunday school. But anyway, little plug there. But when I was in Sunday school, I was growing up at a church and everything. And so this is something, if you're a preacher's kid, you know how this is. I'm, the, the celebration of life I'm doing today, that lady was the daughter of a preacher. So there's a few things I know about her, even though I didn't know her. Because I, I too was a preacher's kid and a preacher's grandkid. I know how that goes. And so... Both of us were preacher's kids. The minister of music's child was in the classroom with me. And then I was the youth pastor's kid. Okay? And so we were in this Sunday school class. And he was telling a story. The teacher was asking about what had happened that week. And she was going over who was in Sunday school the week before and who wasn't. And he wasn't in Sunday school the previous week. So the teacher asked and said, you know, we'll go with Joe. His name wasn't Joe. But he said, she said, Joe, where were you last week? Well, my parents forgot me. And everybody's like, well, what are you talking about? And remember, this is the minister of music's child, right? Showing you minister families are people too. But, but so he had six siblings, and he was the youngest. And he says, everybody got ready for church, and they left me. And then the teacher said, well, were you dressed? Yes. Did you have your Bible? Yes. Did you eat your breakfast? Yes. What was the problem? I don't know. They just forgot me. And so the family went to church and they worshiped. And then they got home and they realized, oh, we forgot Joe. And Joe was sitting right at the table and said, well, I guess I'm not going to church today. And so he felt forgotten. He felt like he had been left. And indeed he was. And maybe you have stories like that. I mean, many of us have had that moment as a child where we're in the middle of the grocery store and we can't find mom or dad and we don't know where they are and we kind of have a freak out moment. And as believers in Christ, we have that too. And did you know that Satan wants you to feel forgotten? Satan wants you to feel like God has abandoned you. He wants you to feel like God's forsaken you. But how many times do we preach from this pulpit that God cannot contradict himself? Because he said in his word that he does not leave you and he does not forsake you. So how can God contradict himself? And so this morning's message I'm hoping is going to be a comforting message. That you have a father that's never going to forget you. And here's another thing. Satan, if Satan can't get you to think that your heavenly father has not forgotten you. If he can't get you on that, he's going to get you to think that your family has forgotten you. He's going to try to get you to think that your friends have forgotten you. And he's definitely going to try to think, get you to think that your church and your pastor have forgotten about you. Here, here's a good rule of thumb. If you think that somebody's not contacting you, why don't you contact them? Hello. I mean, we just sit there. Some people sit there and they wait for somebody to contact them. Feeling like they're forgotten. Pick up the phone and do it yourself. I mean, we live in an age where you can talk to somebody at any time you want. So maybe... Maybe we feel forgotten because maybe we're forgetting others. Think about that. And so we have an unforgettable father. I can't mention forgetfulness without mentioning home alone, right? I mean, Christmas time's coming. And there are there's so much during Christmas time. People absolutely love that movie. Okay? And they'll sit down and watch that movie. I like that movie. But that entire movie focuses on the plot of a little boy getting left at home and defending himself while his family is in France or wherever they're at. And until they get home, he's defending himself and he does all these games and these gimmicks. But you realize that first thing that he does where he realizes he's forgotten and he puts his hands on his cheeks and opens up his mouth and he screams, I'm home alone. And that hits him, right? 
And he goes to his brother's room. I don't remember that dude's name. But he goes into that guy's room. And he's trying to get him to come out. And he's like, hey, you know, I'm messing with you. Stum, come get me. And he finally realizes he's forgotten. That moment does not happen to a believer. You think that it does. Because Satan has caused you to feel that way. But God does not forget you. If you're in him. So if you have a copy of God's word today. I want to invite you to open up to the 8th chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 12. If you are physically able, if you would, please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed, the rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the water had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. Of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot. And she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening and behold in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, sent forth the dove and she did not return to him anymore. Father God, we ask that you would move in a mighty way during our service today. As we open up your word, I pray you would pierce hearts, change lives for your glory and our good. Hide me behind your cross. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to ask you the question as you're being seated today. I want to ask you the question, how can we see in this passage that our God is incapable of forgetting us? In other words, how can we remind ourselves... That God cannot forget about you. Because here's the thing. I've had many conversations with folks that have feel like God has forgotten them. It could be because they're going through a really hard time. Maybe it could be the passing of a family member. It might could be a disease. It could be being in the hospital. It could be all of these different things that have caused you to feel like God has forgotten you. And let's just be really frank and really honest. I think we've all had those moments where we kind of look up and say, Why is God silent? Has God forgotten me? Like, God, do you not see that this is going on? Do you not see that this is happening? Do you not hear my prayers? And we feel like that. And I hope today's message, if it's not for you today, save that program, save that outline, and tuck it in your Bible. And remember, when Satan tries to throw that temptation at you, to feel like God has forgotten you, God cannot forget about you. He can't. He's not capable of that. So how can God do something he's not capable of? Because I'm sure that Noah and his family, they might have felt like that. I mean, they get shut in this ark and then boom, that's it. In other words, you get the toy but no directions. You're just there. And you're on this ark. I mean, how many of us felt like that during COVID? I mean, we couldn't come and worship in the house of God. We worshiped in our homes. Nothing wrong with that. Some people still hadn't come back. Thankfully, it hadn't affected this church, but it's affected a lot of churches. So, how do we know God is incapable of of forgiving us? Number one, I want you to see worthy of remembrance. Look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. Look at that phrase, but God. But God. Because the the Noah narrative, so to speak, follows from Genesis chapter 6 to Genesis chapter 9. So verse 1 of chapter 8 is right smack dab in the middle of both of this. Everything in the Noah narrative changes after that phrase, but God. 
Everything before this phrase, but God, is destruction, is death, is judgment. It's the bursting forth of the geysers from under the earth. It's the falling out of the rain from the windows of heaven. All that's happening, but God. And some of you need to realize that you have a but God moment. What's your but God moment? Your but God moment where you were, you were dead in your sin and you were on a one-way ticket to the gates of hell. Right? I know some of y'all are scared because you don't like this kind of preaching, but suck it up. Amen. I mean, seriously, you were on that point where you were heading straight to hell, but God came in and he saved your soul. And if you haven't had that but God moment, you need to have it today. You need to have that moment where you can look back. Because just like the Noah narrative, all of you have a narrative in your life. Beginning of your narrative, um, how many of you were sad about Loretta Lynn passing? I was sad. Daughter of a, or a coal miner's daughter. I love that song. No, I'm not singing it. But I love that song, okay? But anyway, I was reading her bio. It starts out, she was born. She had so-and-so as her father and mother. Yada, yada, yada. Same thing when you read an obituary, right? That's how it always starts out. So you have your narrative. So-and-so born of so-and-so born, where in this year and that year. But where in your narrative is that but God moment? Like I was doing my own thing. I was living my own life. But God. Some people have a but God moment and still think God forgets them. If you have a but God moment, God never forgets you. He can't. So, but God remembered Noah. Look at that. Remembered. God remembered. Now, this word, remembered, it is not used to mean that God forgot them. That's what some people think that word is used for. Oh, well, that word is used because God forgot about them. No, let's look at this word, church. Because what's happening here is it is, this is a, this is a situation where humanistic characteristics, the writer... We studied this in biblical hermeneutics last year. But the writer is putting humanistic characteristics to God, not to disrespect God, but to help us to better understand what's happening here. And there's a big word for that, and I have it all lined up for me to tell it to you, but I just don't want to mess it up. Because sometimes... No, never mind. Okay, so this is where humanistic characteristics are ascribed to God. So when I say worthy of remembrance... I'm not trying to toot your horn here, but I am going to try to make you feel good for a second, because it's true. You are worth remembering. You're worth remembering. I know you're sinful. I am too. But God has saved you. You're in the palm of his hand. You're worth remembering. And you know, that's something I need to do a better job of. We need to do a better job of. We're all worth remembering. Not just by God, but by each other. Like, we're worth that. Right? Like, we're worth caring for one another. Don't wait on me and don't wait on your deacon to care for people. Why can't you do it? Right? Like, we're worth that. All of us are worth that. We're worth looking out for each other. I was told of a testimony coming out of Sunday school hour of how there was a situation at Sunday school and, and, a, and a Sunday school class rallied around folks and helped them and loved them. We're worth that, church. You're worthy of that remembrance. And I don't say that to make you feel, you know, worthy. And I don't say that for you to get the big head so that when you try to leave today, we got to pry you out the door. That's not what I'm saying that for. But you need to realize one reason people struggle with thinking that God's forgotten them is they think they're not worth anything. And no matter what human beings have said to you, but God remembered Noah. I know you didn't build an ark, but God remembered, insert your name. God remembered Stafford. God remembered Steve. God remembered William. God remembered Sonny Gale. God remembered you. When you were at your lowest on the way to hell, he remembered you. Now, that doesn't mean remember as in the sense he forgot you. That means that he was thinking about you. There's two important aspects we're going to look at. We're going to look at the meaning of God's remembrance. It's different than our kind of remembrance. We need to look at that word, zakar. Zakar is the Hebrew word that is used here. And zakar, when it is used in the Hebrew Bible, is used in covenant language. All the covenants in the Old Testament, you'll see the word zakar. Not all of them, but that's kind of the thing we get here. Kenneth Matthews said God is acting in accordance with his earlier promise to Noah. In other words, he's recalling to mind, he's bringing up the covenant that was made and remembering him. So you ask, well, what is my covenant? Jesus Christ. That's your covenant, the new covenant. God never forgot about Noah and his family on the ark. 
The word remembered in the Bible is used in terms of deliverance. Warren Wiersbe said, God can't forget anything because he knows the end from the beginning. Rather, it means to pay attention to, to fulfill a promise and act on behalf of somebody. So when God remembers you, he's acting on your behalf. We just sang about that in that song, Raise a Hallelujah, that God is fighting for you. Do you realize when you say that God has forgotten you, do you realize that God is fighting for you even when you don't recognize it? What if we get to heaven and we realize all the things that God protected us from? You hear those stories about how somebody was heading to work and something occurred that caused them to be late and, and then there ended up being an accident in that exact spot. You hear those kind of things. But how many moments of those are there that we don't know about? I mean, how many of those things where God has protected us and we don't know, but yet we say, oh, God's forgotten me? I visited somebody one time. And they said, not only did God forget me, but you forgot me too. I said, both are wrong. We shouldn't have to have the attention of everybody else to feel like we're being remembered. Because according to God's definition of remembrance, it is to fulfill a promise and act on behalf of somebody. You know how you can remember somebody? You can pray for them. Act on behalf of somebody. Act on behalf. Sure, a handshake and a hug is great, but acting on behalf is the body of God. We're worth remembrance. Not only does God think we're worth remembrance, but we should think each other's worth it too. God took action on the covenant that he had made. Church, it's very easy for a lot of us to feel like the psalmist did when he wrote this in Psalms chapter 10, verse 1. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Have you ever felt like that? Like when something's going on, you just feel like God has just distanced himself? Have you ever thought about the fact that he's not a genie in the bottle and that he's supposed to teach you stuff? Like God is supposed to teach you. Like if you want to feel good and feel like you're on a cruise ship, go down to the country club. Get you a membership. That's not what this is. It's a battleship. In the same way on a battleship, when soldiers are, or sailors are reprimanded for some behavior, that behavior has to be corrected. The behavior in the life of a Christian needs to be corrected. Look at Hebrews 13.5. God does act on your behalf every single day. He's acting on your behalf now because most of you, the last I checked, are breathing. So don't you think that God is allowing everything in your body to operate? You say, that's not what my doctor told you. That's what God told me in his word. Right? Doctors can say all they want. It's God who has the final say. Have you ever thought about the fact that we might put the opinions of doctors above the opinion of God? Have you ever thought about that? Or politicians? I know I'm stepping on toes. It's quiet in here. But I'm going to keep preaching. The meaning of God's remembrance is vital. But it's not just the meaning of God's remembrance. It's the message of God's remembrance for God's people. Look at this. One of my favorite phrases in the Bible is, Bible is but God. After the phrase, but God, in verses 1b through verse 5, we see renewal happening. And we'll explain that in verse 2. But I want to give you some biblical examples of God remembering his people. Because it's just not Noah that God remembered. There's a lot of people that God remembered. And God has remembered you. I've had those moments. And what I mean, and i got to keep saying this. When God remembers, he's acting on behalf. So I've had a lot of times in my life, and you've had a lot of times in your life, where God has acted on your behalf. And I'll just be really frank and blunt with you. If you feel like you haven't, you just haven't, you just haven't opened your eyes to see it. Because he has. I promise you he has. Because you're breathing. Think about that. Even something as simple as breathing. Until you have a breathing problem, you don't realize how good it is to breathe. And you know, I'll, I will go here. Yeah, I will go here. Because I'm going to be transparent. You know, I realized I had a breathing problem three weeks ago. No, it wasn't a heart attack or anything like that. That I know of. It's called stress. When it builds up and you feel the tension in your chest, guess what? We need to help God's people. We can't just expect us to just figure it out. We've got to help God's people. We're worth Remembering, look at these biblical examples of how God remembered his people. Look at Genesis 19, verse 29. God remembered Abraham and rescued Lot from destruction in Sodom. 
1 Samuel 1.11, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. God remembered Hannah and allowed her to conceive a son. Look at Exodus 2.24. The Lord remembered His covenant and delivered the Jews from the bondage of Egypt. And in Genesis 7-8, through Noah and his family, they've been on this ark. And then in verse 1 of chapter 8, God remembered Noah. But God remembered Noah. But God acted on His behalf. But God remembered the covenant. He recalled the covenant. And He brought it back to mind. Your covenant is in the life of Jesus Christ. And what Jesus did in your life is what you hold on to. That's what you hang your hat on. That is your remembrance. And Jesus said in John 10 verses 27 through 30 that nothing 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 can snatch them out of my hands God has not forgotten you once you're in the hand of God nothing takes you out you have an unforgettable father a father that is incapable of forgetting you God will not forget you that's it that's the sermon but we still got two more points I want you to see the winds of renewal not only do you see the worth of remembrance you're worthy of remembrance church but also the winds of renewal. Look at Genesis 8.1. Again. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. Now there's been a lot of theological controversy on whether that was an actual wind that God allowed to happen or whether that was the Spirit of God going over the waters. Look. It could be either one of those, but God made a wind blow over the earth. That's what we need to know there. And see, what happens here is the second part of verse 1 through verse 5 is really important because it sounds a lot like the creation account. There's a lot of similarities in the two. But see, the creation account was when the world wasn't here yet. This is the renewal. And I think we might talk about that a little bit next week. I haven't decided, but I think we'll talk a little about renewal next week. But renewal can be defined as an instance of resuming an activity or state after an interruption. What's the interruption here? Duh, the flood. Pretty big interruption there. So that's the eruption. So there's some renewal that's getting ready to occur. We know that God doesn't forget us. But we also need to be thankful for the renewal that He gives us in our life. Let's talk about that. How can God renew Have you ever had that moment where God gives you a wind of fresh air in your life? Maybe He takes away a burden. Or He makes a way where there is no way. Or there's something that occurs that you know it's only God. Hey, why don't we pause a second and talk about the renewal that's happened in this church. Right? Dead people becoming alive. Church, I don't have to tell you this, but 33 baptisms in one year doesn't just happen. It's because God sends a renewal. Right? A breath of that fresh air. And we praise Him for that. And we lift up His name for that. And we continue on with that. Look at Lamentations 3, 22-23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Some translations say, great is thy faithfulness. Look at Romans 12, 1-2. One of my favorite passages in the Bible. I've said that four times this morning. Oh well. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. By the testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. I think the Lord shows Noah four specific signs of renewal in this passage. Now, you might have also experienced these, experienced these signs of renewal. Maybe not in the way Noah did, but I think many of us have. Number one, the rescue. Look at verse 1. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the water subsided. The word for God that is used here in the Hebrew language is Elohim, which is used a lot in the Old Testament, specifically the Pentateuch. The word that is used here for wind is the Hebrew word ruah, which in some cases is translated to wind or to spirit. Kenneth Matthews stated, the language of the passage echoes the description of Genesis 1, showing that God has set about making a new creation. This is not the only time that we see God use His mighty wind, right? Look at Exodus 10, 13. We see in that passage that Moses witnessed the Lord bring the locusts to be used in the plague, and then he sends them away with wind. He brought them in with wind, and he sent them out with the wind. Look at Exodus 10, 13. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind, an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locust. We see the rescue. God's Spirit rescuing. Whether it's the wind or whether it's the Spirit, God rescuing Noah, and God rescued you when the Holy Spirit knocked on the door of your heart. 
Not only do we see that, look at verse 2. We see the restraint, right? The restraint. Genesis 8, 2. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. So slow down, stop. If you've if you're got a horse, you know, you, you restrain them, you stop them, you slow it down. When has God done that for you? A whole lot. When you feel overwhelmed and you just don't know. Have you ever thought about maybe God's restraint is maybe you opening your eyes to His protection more? Might not be the taking away, it might be the protecting from, and you just now realized it. The restraint that occurs there. Warren Wearsby said, A God powerful enough to cover the earth with water is also wise enough to know how to dispose of it when the work is done. I mean, don't you believe that? I mean, if God is wise enough to cause the entire earth to flood, don't you think He can stop it whenever He wants? We must also view the restraint as a reversal of Genesis 7, 11 through 12. It's not a regret, but a reversal. Part of the renewal in your own personal life is to allow God to reverse things that sin made regular. Whoa, preacher. I don't like that. I don't like that kind of preaching. But hey, isn't that renewal is? Renewal is not to be a regret. It's to be a reversal. And we'll talk about that in the third point. So I'll save my thunder for that. Not only do you see the rescue, you see the restraint, but look at verse 3, you see the receding. And no, not a receding hairline like I got. Believe it or not, it's going back. I think, that, I think y'all might be causing some of that, I don't know. Verse 3 of Genesis chapter 8, And the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. What does that mean? It means that they're not rising anymore, right? They're not coming up out of everywhere. The word abated is defined as becoming less intense or widespread. The clean, in other words, the cleaning process had begun. God was not going to continue to let it flood for the rest of the time. It was time for the receding to come. And then also I want you to see the rest. Look at verses 4 through 5. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. On the first day of the month, in the tops of the mountains were seen. Now, I want you to stay with me before we go to the last point. This part's really important. Ararat was known as an extensive territory that borders the northern Mesopotamian region and the ancient world, in the ancient world. Mount Ararat is, would be, or is in modern day Turkey, okay, modern day Turkey. Mount Ararat does not have a spiritual significance in the life of Israel, but it is mentioned in Scripture in 2 Kings 19.37, Isaiah 37 verse 38, and Jeremiah 51.27. Other than this recording of Mount Ararat, those are the three other occurrences in Scripture. But even the name of Noah, as you remember from the first week in this series, the name of Noah means rest. Nuah, N-U-A-H. Nuah literally means rest. Not only did God give renewal through the rescue, the wind, He gave it the restraint with the rain, the receding with the rain, but He gave rest to the weary travelers that had probably been seasick, right? I mean, they probably were just tired of being on the boat. I want you to notice this, though. I want you to look at the date of rest. It's very important that the date of the rest is given to us in verses 4 through 5. There's a wonderful, and I've already mentioned it before, but a, a Christian apologist and scientist by the name of Dr. Henry Morris who pointed out the significance of the date that the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. Verse 4 of chapter 8, in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month. Here's what he said about it. Henry Moore said this. He said, The Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead also on the 17th day of the second month. The seventh month of the Jewish civil year calendar, or civil year later, was made the first month of the religious year. And the Passover was set for the 14th day of that month. What does that mean? It means if you look at the calendar that they were using at that time, and then you transcribe it to the calendar that was used at Christ, the same date that were given that the ark sounded on Mount Ararat was the same day that Christ was crucified many years later what does that mean Christ is rest when Christ died they were able to trust in him and have rest from the old covenant law we know that Christ is our Passover who is slain for us and who has given us rest church we have an unforgettable father he shows us that through the worth of remembrance. He shows us that through the winds of renewal. And finally, but not, not, or finally, as we get to this, he shows us with the window release. 
Now, if you watch the devotional video that I sent out this week, it, it's pretty much point three. But if you didn't, I want you to hang on. I want you to see the window release here. You can know that God hadn't forgotten you because of the worth of remembrance, because of the winds of renewal, but also the window release. If you haven't heard anything I said ever, please listen to this. Because when you get to verses 6 through 12 of this passage, it's really re easy to just kind of read it and be like, okay, he sent out a raven, he sent out a dove, the dove came back, yada, 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 everything's good. They get out of the ark and they go, you know, all that, recreate and all that stuff. Wonderful, right? That's, that's just what we think. But I think there's something so much deeper in this passage here. I believe the, the window release that God is wanting us to learn is a lesson about how unforgettable he really is. I've read this scripture since I was a child, and it wasn't until in the early hours of my study this week that God revealed to me. And, and through a wonderful commentator, he revealed to me something brand new about this passage. Now, J. Vernon McGee, he's the one that kind of interpreted it this way. So when you hear this interpretation, a lot of this did come from J. Vernon McGee, but I've added a little bit of my own taste on it too. Because I want you to see in the window release, I want you to see the natures of the human flesh that are signified in two birds. In verses 6 through 12, and don't leave out of here call me the bird man. But this is really cool. I uh, kind of thought that was funny, but not really. But anyway, um, but you laugh, so whatever. Um, I want you to see in these two birds, first you see the raven, right? You see the raven and you see the dove. Those are the two birds that are used in this passage. Let's read verses 6 and 7. It talks about the raven. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. The raven never returned. Now, we don't know the purpose of the raven. The Bible doesn't tell us why Noah sent out a raven first. I think, we, I think there's something here, church. I want you to see that the raven is representing the old flesh. Like we talked about at the beginning of this message, the old flesh, the old you, right? You before you knew Jesus, okay? And sometimes that raven flies up in your life, right? Yeah, okay, you here? Are you ready to go eat? I don't know what you're ready to do. But the raven comes up and that old flesh raises its ugly head and you want sin more than you want the Lord. The raven was an unclean bird while the dove was a clean bird. And obviously that would come later on with the sacrificial laws and all of that. But you remember at the end of verse 6 where there's a clear line there that says that, that Noah gathered the clean and the unclean birds. That has a lot to do with chapter 8 here. Now, we need to ask ourselves a question, why was the raven sent and why didn't it come back? Number one, we don't know why the raven was sent. Maybe the raven was sent so that we would learn about the old flesh nature. Maybe. But the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why. But we do know why it didn't come back. Ravens feast on something called carrion. What is that? Carrion is the decaying flesh of dead animals. I'm sorry to be graphic. But if you drive down the road and you see roadkill, let me tell you something. There's not near as much roadkill down here as there is in the upstate. I don't know why that is. I know y'all think you have a lot of roadkill. You don't have near as much as the upstate. I don't know why. Maybe it's at the bottom of the mountain. They're coming down. I don't know what's going on. But whenever you see roadkill, you see ravens, right? Vultures, ravens, whatever the case may be, coming and going and eating that carry-on dead, decaying flesh. So don't you think that because of the flood that there would be a lot of dead animal flesh. So why would the raven need to come back? He's got a full buffet. I mean he's got better than golden corral. He's got the whole thing. All to himself. So why would that raven ever want to come back? Look at the dove. And then we'll wrap all this up. The dove in verses 8 through 12. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. So he sends the dove to see if there's land, right? To see if they can go out. To figure out how this is going to work. Verse 9, But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark. Returned, 
And, sh- and whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. For the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days. And again he set forth the dove out of the ark. Notice how the dove keeps coming back. Why? Because there's no land out there. And the dove came back to him in the evening. And behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove. And she did not return to him. So the dove didn't return because it was finally safe to do so. In other words, when the dead, decaying animal flesh was all over the ground, the dove didn't want any part of that. The dove returned home. The dove returned home. The wor- the, and, and what's happening here is the world at this time was a judged world. God had judged the world. Noah would have officially been the world's very first bird watcher. Recorded bird watcher. When he sent the dove out the first time, it returned with nothing, and he sent it out again, and he got the olive branch, and he sent it out the third time, and it never came back. God's word teaches us in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that you were born with an old nature and a new nature. The old flesh, and if you're a believer in Christ, born again the new flesh. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So as a believer in Christ, you are either a raven or you're a dove. And every day you change what bird you are. The Apostle Paul spoke of these two natures in multiple times. And we struggle with this, right? We struggle with the old flesh and the new flesh. We see how the raven went to a judge world, but he found feast on the dead carcasses. The old nature is like that raven, feasting on the ways of the world. So some of us will fly out from the house of God today, and we'll feast on sin, and we'll feast on sin, and we'll feast and feast and feast. You were not made to be a raven. They're ugly birds. Sorry. If you like ravens, I'm sorry. But they are. And you're ugly when you live in your flesh. I don't care how good you pretty this up on the inside. You're ugly when you live in sin. In the eyes of God. Notice we don't get a lot of amens on that. Why? Because we want to be like that raven. We want to soak up all the sin and all the dead stuff. Why? Because it tastes good. It ain't going to taste good burning in hell. Hello. The raven never came back. The dove did. The dove flew in the world. The dove saw all of that. Wasn't attracted to it. You say, yeah, preacher, it wasn't attracted to that because they don't eat that. Okay, maybe that's the point. Show us an illustration. You're made into a new image of Christ, so why do you keep playing with stuff that Christ already died for? Wow. Why do we keep playing with stuff that he already died for? The dove went out in the same judge world but didn't find any rest. No satisfaction as she went back to the ark. In the same things, we are not to love the world. Yes, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. You have an unforgettable father. You have an unforgettable father that shows you that because the worthy, the worth of remembrance, the winds of renewal. And don't you see that in the window of rescue? Don't you see that because God has not forgotten you, that he wants you to live a life in the new flesh, not the old flesh? I know the old flesh is still going to raise its ugly head. You're still going to have temptations for sin. But when was the last time that you kicked Satan in the mouth? Why don't you come down to the altar and do that this morning? You can come down and grab my hand. We can pray about something. Hey, you know what? If there's a line that starts at the invitation, deacons, you come on down and you accept people to come. And you minister to them. Why can't we do that, church? Why can't we have a church where the altar's full? Because we're broken hearted. Because we don't want to be the same. We want to leave out a dove flying in the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. Some of you are living the life of a raven. You're going to every dead carcass you can go to. Licking it all up. And then going to the next one. Hey, why why can't we be a dove in a world full of ravens? You have an unforgettable father. He's not going to forget about you. Have you forgotten about him? Maybe Maybe today's the day that you act on behalf of him, right? 
Maybe you don't know about this father because you're not saved. If you're not saved, come grab my hand and I'll talk to you about it. Or grab somebody's hand. Like I said, deacons, if it fills up and there's a line, you guys come down here. If it's somebody wanting to join, you send them my way. But somebody needing prayer, you minister to them. Because it's time that we stop living the life of a raven and start living it like a dove. Father God, we just want to thank you and praise you for the opportunity to worship you today. Lord, I just want to pray and ask, Father, that you would move in this time of invitation. God, I just pray that if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that is not saved, they can't fly like a dove because they're not a dove because they don't know you. Lord, we can't be a new creature in Christ unless we, we allow you to, to save us so that we can be that new creature. Maybe somebody needs to do that today. Maybe, God, there's somebody, I know there's somebody, Lord, that needs to come down here and just repent and ask you to forgive and just say they're sorry. Lord, they've been playing games with you, and it's time to put those games aside. It's time to realize that you are an unforgettable Father. Not only are you incapable of forgetting us, you can't forget us, but, God, how could we ever forget you? For what you've done for us. You sent your son to die for us. And if we ever get over that. We don't truly understand the gospel. Lord if there are people that want to come and join this church today. Lord I thank you for the new members class. That you've allowed us to have over the last six weeks. It's been a wonderful class Lord. If those folks are ready to make that decision. May today be that day. That they unite with this church. Not to be an attender. But to be a committed fearless warrior for Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, if you would, please. This is Pastor Brady, and thank you for tuning in to today's live worship service here from First Baptist Church of Gaston. Maybe today you feel the Lord tugging on your heart after that message and after our worship service. If you would, please email or call the number below or email the email address, and you can contact us if you made a decision. Maybe you want to talk with me about accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you want to talk to somebody about rededicating your life. Or just maybe you want more information about The Caring Place. You want more information about our church and the different ministries that we offer. Whatever the case may be, I want to invite you to respond. I want to thank you for watching, whether it's on Facebook, maybe it's on YouTube, or even our website. No matter where you're watching, we thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you next time. And don't forget, we love you here at The Caring Place. It gathers, grows, and goes all to the glory of God.